All right, hello everyone, and thank you for tuning in once again to the Black Box Podcast, BBOR, Black Box Online Radio. Now, today we're still talking about Amanda Knox, and this is one of the cases that I've been going through some things recently. I mentioned in the first couple uploads that I wasn't super familiar, well, I was out of date, out of touch with the information, rather, because, you know, this was something that happened years ago. They are talking about back to 2007 was the murder of Meredith Kircher, and of course this received a lot of coverage in 2011 during the exonerations of Amanda Knox and her ex-boyfriend, Rafaela. And then, you know, like, um, I really got pulled into this back when they were talking about some news coverage about Amanda Knox in 2015, which has been, you know, nearly four years ago. This is just one thing that people can't seem to let go. But for a long time on this channel, I was covering the O.J. Simpson case because that's one again. Once again, there are just some things in that one that people just cannot shake. So let's have a little bit of a discussion now about some things that were going on with the Amanda Knox case and the murder of Meredith Kircher back in 2007. Prior to this um, recording, like I was watching the BBC documentary on Amanda Knox as well as the Diane Sawyer interview, which is like the, I don't know, the fifth or sixth time I've seen that thing. But I just wanted like a refresher about some things. When it comes to this case, I think that this is one of the true crime cases that really gets marketed to a wider range, like a wider audience outside of the traditional true crime circles. And with this one, it comes down to the fact that so many people are trying to vilify Amanda Knox because of her character. And I talked about this in the first couple uploads about how the police could not really escape their own perversions, asking sexual details about Meredith Kircher. Not to mention that um, a lot of this whole thing, like Amanda Knox is the leader of a sex ring along with Rafaela and Rudy Gaeta, that um, this is like something that was kind of concocted by an Italian journalist. But that's not all of it. I mean, it's also that the prosecution in this really went for character assassination as opposed to the forensic evidence like um when i read through like some of the forensic things i really just think overwhelmingly that amanda knox is innocent but then we talked about the kind of uh ted talk lie detector thing when they did a very convincing presentation about how she is really exhibiting a lot of the signs of a of someone who is not telling the truth using you know those sort of um physiological signs of not telling the truth, let's say that. And, you know, their presentation is convincing. I'm not 100% convinced, but I think it's a a very um, nice presentation. And you can listen to my upload on Amanda Knox TED Talk Lie Detection here on Black Box Radio. And there's a link to the TED Talk that they're referencing, and they match some things up. And it's interesting to hear all the same. What really happened, though? Well, it seems like that there was an individual named Rudy Gaeta. I always mispronounce his last name, so let's just call him Rudy. You know, he is the, um, of course, immigrant to Italy from the Ivory Coast, and he was definitely in the apartment. He was definitely involved with this in some way. They found his DNA at the scene. I believe very, believe very specifically blood evidence. Now, everybody believes that he's involved. What I would say could actually be a more entertaining and kind of thought-provoking exercise as well as just something that could be of genuine value is trying to find out was he acting alone did he have an additional accomplice that has never been named yet i'm not talking about Raphaela solicitor i'm not talking about amanda knox i'm talking about somebody else who was an additional accomplice because when i was reading my very first articles about amanda knox ever years ago Someone was really just kind of arguing that point, and I thought that it would resurface more frequently that Rudy had an accomplice, that he had somebody that he was working with that he, to commit the murder of Meredith Kircher. And that person, that's the real person that got away with everything. The only things that we can say about that is just that um, based on how hard Rudy tried to destroy Amanda and Rafaela in the prosecution, really trying to concoct that there was a story going on. If if I recall from the BBC documentary, Rudy's story was just that he went into the bathroom, he put his headphones on, and he was, I believe, genuinely, I believe this is true, he was sitting on the toilet, and then he could hear some things through his headphones, and he wasn't sure what they were, 
And then he recognized that it was the voice of Amanda Knox. And I was like, yeah, okay, you were listening to an iPod on the toilet and you heard someone get murdered and you didn't do anything? Um, yeah, okay, sir. Um, you're going to be spending a long time in prison. Well, um, aside from that, though, when it comes to the court of public opinion, Amanda Knox really gets vilified mostly on character, personality, they think that she's very obscure. A lot of people just plain don't like her. I even said in some of the earlier uploads that I just plain did not like some of the things that she was writing in her book, Waiting to be Heard. When I was reading that, it was just like, there's just some things that make you feel a little bit angry. It's just like about uh, decision making and stuff like that, about, you know, those types of behaviors. And supposedly Meredith Kircher was someone who was on the same page with that. Meredith Kircher had also been very critical of Amanda Knox's behavior, and some of the kind of um, armchair theories out there is that um, Amanda Knox cre created this sort of quote-unquote sex ring as a way to deal with Meredith Kircher because she didn't like being judged by Meredith Kircher and, you know, the high and mighty holier-than-thou attitude. And that's really more than an armchair theory, to be honest. That is something that is more like, well, is part of the mainstream prosecution narrative. You can always find that very famous line that they wrote about her saying that they believe Amanda Knox said something, oh, you think you're such a goody-goody, well, now you're going to be forced to have sex. I don't actually think that happened, by the way. That exact line was probably never, ever uttered. But even in, on one of the first comments that came in here, on this channel about the Amanda Knox case. Someone was referring to the people who support Amanda Knox as being innocent. Say so they say support her, they were calling them Knox huggers. People that are just refusing to admit that she is guilty or that she could be involved with stuff. And once again, I just think that this is a case that has kind of evolved to something that is outside of the traditional true crime circles where you're dealing with a much larger pop culture audience. And a lot of people are refusing to really look at more things like physical evidence. I mean, one of the pieces of physical evidence that they tried to use against her was that they found Amanda Knox's DNA on a knife in Rafaela's home. But it's like, well, obviously, then she would have used that at some point during the seven days that they had known each other. And then, like, that's the famous knife that has the, um, that has the speck of blood that they believed came from Meredith Kircher, but we talked about that one. That was one of the biggest things about how the three American laboratories tried to extract DNA from a sample that small, and they were not able to do so. They were just like, it's most likely, for lack of a better term, that the investigators who came up with that statement fabricated that piece of evidence, and that that was just not... Fabricated it or made a genuine mistake, or they just um were... They were at fault for something. I mean, so it's like, I mean, they said that they found Amanda Knox's DNA on the handle, mind you, not on the blade. Well, I mean, like, she was in that apartment for, like, at least seven days. It's like, I mean, there's going to be DNA all over the place, you know, especially when you're talking about things that are not specifically blood. So it's like, you can sort of kind of see how these situations get blown out of proportion but the whole reason why i wanted to talk about you know personality was we talked about the story about rudy sitting on the toilet listening to music through his headphones and you, you know i kind of said that that's sort of like bad judgment right do, do you think that you might hear somebody screaming and then you wouldn't do anything this is why people don't like amanda knox because it's the whole story of walking into your house you think the door, like, the door is open, which it shouldn't be. You don't really think anything about it. You walk to the bathroom, you see blood in the sink. Remember, just speckles of blood, not that much. You see the specks of blood, and then you just like, eh, it's totally normal, and you just take a shower. And then you're just like, hey, wait, where's my roommate? And all of those things. Um, Supposedly, there was an eyewitness sighting of Amanda Knox early on the day well, you know, if Meredith Kircher had been murdered at night the following morning, supposedly there was a sighting of Amanda Knox at a store buying cleaning products, but the short story is I don't believe that one. I think that someone might have kind of came up with that as sort of like after the fact they kind of came up with that story. But one of the things is people are just like, 
this 20 year old is walking into her home the door is open she doesn't think anything about it then you know like she sees blood in the sink doesn't think anything about it just takes a shower and just like isn't just processing anything and people are like that sounds really suspicious but that's how we get to the cool concept of being weird is not a crime it's like and somebody even asked the question is amanda knox autistic and well no i don't believe amanda knox is autistic is she like uh was at the time at the time was she a little bit oblivious to her surroundings perhaps that's true well at the same time though you're not really expecting to be walking into a murder scene if you had nothing to do with it if you had no prior knowledge to it and it's like this really just seems like something that uh got caught up with sensationalism as well as, you know, people are, they sort of needed someone to vilify. And also, it was a very, very big story. They like, they added so much more to the story by trying to think that there's some type of weird sex ring going on. And this girl is the leader of it. This 20-year-old woman from America is kind of orchestrating some type of brutal sex act that turned into a murder. I don't know, some people want to see that in their newsfeed. I hope we never, ever see that again in, for any single reason. But, like, I do have to reiterate, I think that it would be much be more beneficial to uh, try and examine the possibilities. If you're going to do this into sort of a deep dive segment, like, I once polled, like, the um, small audience here that we have for BBOR, and I was like, what would be a good thing to do for a deep dive podcast? I mean, this would be an actual, this would actually be a very good subject to explore. Did Rudy have an accomplice that has not been identified yet? And um, to really get some sort of definitive answers about that. But the thing is, like, when you go through these Amanda Knox things, so much of what you have is kind of just character assassination, and people are attacking her personal character. We talked about the things about her judgment. We talked about, you know, the Knox huggers, you know, who are refusing to kind of listen to it. And we also talked about the concepts of just people don't like the way that she acts so they don't like her personality they don't like i mean just her mannerisms and that's kind of bogs down the investigation but it could be something that we could explore in the future on bbor i get the feeling that these amanda knox things aren't super popular for this channel and there could be some other ex cases that we could explore in a larger fashion like some things that the audience would want to connect with more but this has just been something that I've been following lately, so we decided to do a little bit of recording about it. The next thing that we would really want to say, though, about somebody like Amanda Knox is not only was um, she kind of vilified in the court of public opinion, people focus in on one specific detail to get there. And even in 2019, they're still talking about this girl must be guilty. Who would do a cartwheel after finding out your roommate has been murdered? And they're talking about an incident at the police station where the police asked to see her yoga moves. And, like, I, I don't even know where the origin of that was exactly. Amanda Knox thinks it was a girl that she had told uh, that the police asked to see her yoga moves. And that girl started spraying all these things. Like, it, she, in the Diane Sawyer interview, they talk about that Amanda Knox never did any sort of cartwheel for the police. She never did a back handspring as well. I mean, I don't know. I don't really know the exact origin of it. But 2019, people are still just rambling on about this in the comments sections. Who would be doing cartwheels in front of the police after their roommate was murdered? Apparently, it never happened. Like, never happened. What it says, though, in the book Waiting to be Heard was that... Um, the police asked to see her yoga moves, so she did a split, and she even talks about this in the book. It actually felt good because she hadn't done it in a long time, so they. she actually said it just felt good that she was still able to do it because, you know, she hadn't tried one in a long time. But moreover, it's like, I just really remember people focusing in so much on that on 2015, and two people were going back and forth in an argument about what kind of gymnastics moves she was doing in front of the police. But in reality, it's like, she says this very clearly in the Diane Sawyer interview, that never happened. And, like, that is one thing that I definitely do believe. And I wish that people wouldn't really focus in so much on those particular details, because for starters, it's false, and for seconds, it's completely irrelevant to the forensic information. I mean, even if she did backflips or something in the police because they said, hey, can you do a backflip? And she did one. I mean, that doesn't make you a murderer now, does it? No, absolutely not. 
but people are trying to say that it's abnormal behavior. But in the Diane Sawyer interview, at least in the uh, version that I was watching most recently, in the Diane Sawyer interview, they cut out the part, though, where it says that uh, the police asked her to do the split. They asked to see her yoga moves. And once again, though, I really have to insist, ever since my first upload, that really just sort of seems like they had this kind of attractive 20-year-old woman in front of them, and they wanted to kind of, I don't know, just get her to do stuff. It's like they couldn't escape their own perversions. And that's one of the reasons why we got to the Amanda Knox situation that we have today. And, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm being a little bit blunt there, and I hope that's not too frank, but that's like kind of what I genuinely believe happened. When we want to just sort of, but we just, the thing that we just need to say coming to a conclusion of this upload is a lot of people are really kind of distorting the sensational aspects of the case to kind of make the story seem more sexual than it actually is. And I do confess that Amanda Knox is very bizarre. She had, maybe she's a little bit oblivious and she didn't exercise the proper amount of caution when she was, you know, approaching the scene or just, um, for everything associated with her time in Italy, definitely with uh, vilifying Patrick Lumumba and falsely accusing Patrick Lumumba, which, you know, had some very drastic consequences directed toward him. But when we want to actually get to the question of whether or not she was a murderer, like many people actually believe she is today, I don't believe the forensic evidence supports it in any single way. I definitely believe the evidence much more supports that Rudy was the murderer and that, um, I just think we could find out, is there somebody who got away with the murder as well, like was Rudy working with an additional accomplice? One of the first things I ever read about it, they were saying that there was like the DNA of a fourth person found who is not connected to any of these individuals that we've listed so far, but as far as I know, Rudy's been the only person that's actually still going to be in prison for this. Rafaela and Amanda were completely exonerated. Well, what do you think? Um, do you think after everything that we've talked about here that Amanda Knox could still be guilty? Or do you think that um, she was indeed innocent of the crime of the murder of Meredith Kircher and that she just got vilified in the court of public opinion because of her strange behavior, as well as some things that we talked about, about people kind of altering the details of the case, saying that she did cartwheels and back handsprings in front of police officers for no particular reason, which, you know, wasn't the case, if what she says is indeed true. And not to mention that they wanted to just kind of focus in on some sexual aspects of the case as opposed to the more concrete forensic evidence. What would you have to say? If you have anything to say at all about the Amanda Knox case, I 